Greetings, everyone, and welcome to our concluding presentation on brand equity. We are so grateful to have all of you here. I'm Pranav, a student co-chair of Impact Week, and I'll provide a brief introduction for this special event, which will explore an important and timely topic, racism and branding, which has prompted major companies to reconsider consumer products that relied on appropriate imagery or stereotypes. This event is also co-sponsored by the student-led Sports Business Association and UCLA Anderson Center for Management of Enterprise and Media, Entertainment, and Sports. Today, we're excited to welcome Suzanne Schoen Harjo. I wanna share a few notes on our speaker. She developed landmark laws, led campaigns for native rights, and helped indigenous people protect sacred places and re recover over 1 million acres of land. In awarding her a 2014 Presidential Medal of Freedom, the United States' highest civilian honor, President Barack Obama said, with bold resolve, she pushes us to always seek justice in our time. Active in the No Mascot Movement since 1962, she is part of retiring over 2,000 Indian names, symbols, images, mascots, and behaviors. She is best known for her tireless work to eliminate the vile name and logo of the Washington football team, which announced back in July of last year it would end its racist identity. In 2020, she was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and is a founding member of its new Standing Committee on Anti-Racism. Before I hand it off to our moderator, Professor Hal Hirschfield, I wanna offer a land acknowledgement. As a public and land grant institution, it is important for UCLA to acknowledge that our campus resides on what was historically the homeland of indigenous peoples who are dispossessed of their land. Impact at Anderson and our net impact chapter at UCLA acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. With that, Hal, take it away. Thanks so much. Um, and Suzanne, thank you so much for joining us. We are honored and uh, appreciative of you spending your time with us. Um, so I'll get into it. You know, I have a, a couple of questions. I want to ask some questions about, about you and your background and then some sort of broader questions um, as well. So, you know, first off, I know you love the game of football. What, what initially attracted you uh, to the sport? Uh, to the sport? Uh, yeah. Being born in El Reno, Oklahoma, which is about 25 miles due west of Oklahoma City. And you can't be born near OU football without loving the game. That's fair. Okay. I, I understand that. Um, so, you know, I know uh, some of us have, have seen you talk about this before, but I'm curious if you can sort of recount this to us. I know uh, it must be about over 40 years now, 1974, you had these, uh, an experience at a Washington football game, uh, which, which cemented the importance of, you know, I think in your mind, retiring stereotype team names and mascots. So for the audience here, can you, can you revisit that experience uh, for us? Well, someone gave some tickets to my husband and we went to the game. We had just moved to Washington, DC. We hated the name of the team. It's a horrible name, and we'll go into that more later. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to see what they did there and how they behaved. Mm. So it was sort of an experiment and sort of to see the game, which we'd only seen on television. We'd never seen uh, a Washington team game. So we went there, and people started petting our hair. We both had long hair, really long hair at that time, and started petting our hair and not doing bad things, not hitting us or, or not mm -hmm. that kind of thing, but the kind of thing you do when the person in front of you is not a person, but an object. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is really what objectification is. They were petting us, they were touching us, they were talking around and through and behind and over us and saying, hey, here's one of them over here. Here's, you know, an R word over mm. there. Uh, here's this, here's that. Uh, oh, yeah, really? Are you a real, you know, all of the things that people say that are so dumb. Mm -hmm. And even if they think they're being nice and friendly, it's a heck of a way to interact with other humans. So 
we just couldn't take it anymore and we left yeah. but before the game started we we didn't even wait to see anything and never went again of course so um it, here's the thing it would never in a million years occur to me that i could or i should or i might want to walk up to a person and say hey you're a white woman, aren't you? Or, hey, you're a white man, aren't you? Uh, can I feel your hair? Or not even ask. Just start petting their hair. <laughs> <laughs> it is a funny notion, yeah. Start touching them. Like, um, you know, when people touch you on the arm and say, why are you doing that? Why are you? Yeah. Well, that's why. Because when you turn a person into a thing, you don't respect anything about them you don't respect their boundaries you don't uh, there there are no boundaries they are literally like um something in a zoo yeah or a plant or a nice picture or it it may be something that you like very much nonetheless it's it's more than making the person invisible. It's making the person as if they never existed. Yeah. So that's, that's really, that was the full dose of that. And I was glad I didn't have any children with me. I can imagine. Um, and so I know, you know, starting there or maybe even before, you know, you, you've obviously played a crucial role in helping to eliminate thousands of, stereotype mascots at the high school, the collegiate level. Um, it, it's interesting to think about. I mean, you know, I, I teach the core marketing class and some of the, you know, sometimes we talk about sort of collective movements and how you can sort of spark change. And I, I'm curious, you know, as momentum built at the high school and collegiate level, um, why, you know, why in your opinion, so many professional sports teams were adamant not to change their, their brands, um, many of which had these racist associations, obviously. Well, because it's solely about money. In okay. schools, you have, even if it's big bucks, you have the concern about student health, safety, education, interactions, behaviors, bullying. Uh, there, There's a host of things that you have to be cognizant of when you are dealing with, with real people, students. And the pro teams really don't care. It's all about money. It's all transactional. It's, there's nothing that's about it. They, they only talk about health and safety when, there's a, it, when it's a matter of liability or culpability, as in concussions um, right. and, and the resulting uh, tragedies. Uh, then health is, comes into play. And it's only about harassment of, of and assaults on women in the front office, mm -hmm. in the case of the Washington football team, yeah. when it comes to lawsuits about sexual harassment and, and assault and discrimination. So I, I, I hear that. And I'm, I'm interested in, in what your you know, perspective is, you know, because then we, you know, we zoom to 2020 and investors start calling on Nike, FedEx, Pepsi to cut their ties with, with Washington over their insistence, insistence on, on keeping the, the original name. And so what do you think sort of like, you know, fomented to cause these brands to really put their foot down? What was the, uh, maybe you started to, to get at it. Well, we had started with the, the socially responsible investors uh, long before uh, 2020. Uh, we had started 10 years before okay. and they had, uh, they, the shareholders, we had a coordinated effort. Uh, some of us wrote resolutions, shareholder resolutions or drafted them. And the shareholders mm -hmm. went to uh, FedEx. They went to, uh, some of us would go with them, uh, not to FedEx, but to Bank of America and Nike and others. And no one was very interested or they had a facade of being interested and then 
it was only to get other business or to appease the shareholders for a while. And then the answer was always, well, we have our contractual arrangements and obligations and so on and so forth. So nothing changed. There was, there was, a, there was a series of letters uh, for five years to these top investors and uh, we got nothing. In mm. fact, uh, FedEx people tricked the shareholders who, who were very nice people and, and they believed um, the head of the country uh, of the company and his emissaries when they said, oh, here's here's the date you by which you have to submit this resolution and it would be the wrong date and they would say oh we made a mistake and so the shareholders would say oh they made a mistake and but this when this goes on for three years then you say oh it sure wasn't a mistake was it and then they submitted something on time but oh it doesn't fit the new format, so it's not allowed for this year. Oh, well, there's always next year. So this it kept on and on and on. There was a letter that was sent. But at the same time, um, what really changed was George Floyd was yeah. murdered in front of all of us. Mm -hmm. And most people alive have never seen anyone murdered mm -hmm. and maybe not anyone really die in front of them. So to see such a stark killing with so many people yelling and saying, don't do it, check his pulse, he's not breathing. And, um, and every mother in the world heard him say mama. Mm -hmm. I think just the fact of that shook a lot of people to the core. It certainly made Fred Smith and his yeah. two people, uh, the head of FedEx and his two other minority um shareholders, the 40% conglomerate uh, shareholders uh, in the Washington football team franchise snap to and say they wanted a change. They wanted the name changed. And that was going on before any investor letters were sent for the last time, that last round. And it was, but it was all happening at once. It was all part of the swirl. It, I don't think they were afraid of protest. I don't think that's, some people have speculated that it was demonstrations that put the fear in people. I don't believe that was it. Mm -hmm. I do think there was something that made the people who were marketing Aunt Jemima yeah. say, does it have to be this in order to sell syrup yeah. <laughs> and pancake mix and jams? And it, does it really, uh, and we're just going to do better. And, and something made the people at Jeep Cherokee say, eh, not so much. Yeah. Uh, do, do the Cherokees mind? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and, and by golly, they said, well, yeah, we do. We'd like to talk about this. So a lot of people in significant positions began as, as people started demonstrating, started protesting, but even before that, just the, 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 the zeal for change, the insistence on change in a lot of areas a huge wave that came even before Mr. Floyd was murdered. So you had the, the new head of Land O'Lakes Butter finally 
after we'd been complaining uh, all my adult life and, and many others about the, the sexist, racist image mm -hmm. on the butter, the, the Indian butter maiden. Why? Why does it, why, why yeah. do you have to brag on us all the time? Right, right. <laughs> so, I, why do I think, you know, why do I think what happened? I think all of it came together in, there, there are people who say, oh yeah, our letters did that, our shareholders. We had, a, you know, 500 million billion dollar combined holdings. Well, no one put any of that money to the effort ever. <laughs> yeah. so it wasn't that. It was, it was the same effort that had been going on. Yeah. And that's how you know it's an external, um, almost something that enveloped Mother Earth. You know, and they made all things possible. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, the, the social scientist in me thinks, well, well, of course, this is, you know, multiply de determined. There's so many different things that sort of had to come together that it would almost be impossible to write a script to put all of them together at once, although it had to start with little pieces being chipped away at. Um, you know, I, I'm curious on a sort of a more general sense, you know, we, we've, thanks, of course, to many of your efforts and, and others, we're seeing more and more teams um, and organizations, companies um, change, change their name, change their logos, et cetera. How do you think um, a team or, or a company authentically moves forward? You know, like, I mean, you, you think about, you know, Dan, Dan Snyder, right, uh, adopted this placeholder name, right? The Washington Football Club, which is, yeah, yeah it, you know, and I, I think there's a, a thought when you see that, that this could have happened earlier, you know, uh, it, it, you know, if the, if the argument was, no, we got to wait for the right name. Well, this doesn't really seem like the right name. So, you know, I, I'm curious, you put these things together. How does a team or business authentically move forward after, after a change? Well, that's an excellent question. I have to move back a little farther to what does this represent to the person's inner white supremacist? What hmm. it represents is a toy of racism, hmm. usually of a bully. And they're not going to give up those toys willingly. And they become stubborn when you try to take them from them. Hmm. So you have tantrum after tantrum uh, calling out for this kind of assistance and that kind of assistance and um, so you have bratish behavior. Well, that's what Daniel Snyder did. Uh, he, he, he had an opportunity when he first bought the team to, to make change. We had just won a landmark decision in a landmark case. No one had ever even sued um, to cancel existing trademark license registrations. No one. So our case, the Harjo et al. versus Pro Football Inc. was the first, first time that ever happened. And of course, no one had ever won. So we won in 1999. And that was just as the NFL and Daniel Snyder were concluding their, their um, negotiations and the transfer of the team. We sued on September 10, 1992, John Kent Cook, and then uh, he passed and his son, John Kent Cook, became the owner of the team and the lawsuit. And then it was passed to Daniel Snyder. They all said very similar things. Basically, what uh, Jack Kent Cook had said was, there, there's not a chance in hell that this is going to be changed. Right. Uh, it, it, it's uh, a tradition. It's not offensive and it would cost too much money. Well, not really, not any of those things. It, it is a tradition, but it's a tradition of racism. Lynching is a tradition. The N-word is a tradition. 
there are lots of traditions that aren't worthy of carrying on or passing on to the next generation or even to the next block with mm -hmm. you. You you need to change those kinds of things. So John Kent Cooke had his opportunity to change. Um, ben Nighthorse Campbell, who was a senator at that time when we sued, introduced legislation that was sort of like the kind of action that was taken by Stuart Udall in the early 60s when he integrate he forced the integration of the team, the Washington football team, um, by saying this stadium is on federal land and in order to lease it again, and the lease is coming up, you have to let the black players play. Mm. And that's the only way that George Preston Marshall, the first owner, a, an undisputed bigot, um, even declaring in his will that you know, nothing could go, no, none of his money could go to anyone um, who, was, who was African or Negro. And so he had to integrate the team. And what Ben Nighthorse Campbell did then years later in the 80s was to introduce, uh, in, the, in the 90s, was to introduce legislation that made it a federal offense uh, worthy of not entering into a lease uh, with, with any private entity. Um, any uh, anyone who who would um, market a product based on the appearance of another person and he went into some detail but it was obviously uh, skin color what whatever way you want to comment on the appearance of another person uh, that was not going to be permitted under his legislation and then on the House side, a compa companion bill was introduced mm -hmm. by uh, Eni Falio Mavega, the American Samoa delegate, and by John Lewis, the civil right. rights icon. Right. So they had opportunity, but uh, so John, Jack Ken Cook's re reaction to that could have been to say, Let, let's have a talk about this. Okay. But no, he wouldn't talk with any of us. And what he did was... Um, to move the team out of the district. Right. Right. So, but, so, you know, that's th these, this is, this is almost like a, a case study on how not to do it. Um, yes. So what happened? So what happens once you've made the change, then how do you, you know, like if you were to write the playbook for, sorry for the, Pun there, but <laughs> uh, for for how to move forward authentically, you know, what would you what would you say? Or is that hard? Well, I think first, just common courtesy. Mm -hmm. Answer your mail. Answer the phone. <laughs> okay. Uh, we, we we plaintiffs, by the way, after we won, wrote to Daniel Snyder. I mean, we were pretty excited. He's young. He's Jewish. He might know what we're talking about. Uh -huh. And uh, so we wrote him a letter saying we'd be happy to meet with him and uh, introduce ourselves. And uh, let's talk about why we want the name changed and and that we don't want anything else. That's what we want. Mm -hmm. That's the be all and end all. And he never responded. He did mm. the same thing that Jack Kitten Cook did, which was to um, answer us through the press uh, with basically the same, the same thing. Uh, not offensive, cost too much, is a tradition. Uh, and that's in a town where everyone gets a response to a letter. You have people hired to do that. It, all he had to do was write, dear occupant, <laughs> You right, know? right. <laughs> uh, no, thank you. <laughs> but, right. So that 
that is sort of a, 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 a an initial offense in Washington D.C. Right. <laughs> In in the town of you know white gloved racism, right. So um, this is so. What do you do? Well, that's the first thing. You don't ignore the problem. Yeah. You acknowledge the problem, and think, what do I have to benefit if I keep this name going, or this image going, or this thing going? Um, Kansas City. Do I really need a a ginormous drum? Uh, do I really need a feathered headdress? Do I really need so-called war paint? Mm -hmm. Do I need all of these things? Uh, no, you don't. Is it enough to change the name of the stadium? No. You have to change everything. It's the whole culture that you have created around this because it's a culture of racism. It's a culture of um, ob objectifying it's a it's a culture of dehumanizing so all of it has to be changed and that's why every major national native organization has called for for decades now every single native reference in american sports to be changed and that's why we've had such success in yeah. changing them yeah i i find this so interesting because you know i'm uh one of the first things we teach about rebranding on a business side is it's not enough to change the package. You've got to do everything, right? Because, you know, if you change the box or the, um, you know, the, the font, well, is that really enough to change, you know, to change whatever your associations are previously? But, but it also runs into this really difficult situation that I, you know, I think you're, you've really put your finger on uh, very articulately, which is, you know, what happens when, so, okay, for example, I know that um, in the New York Times, there was an article by uh, Jesenia Klepper. She says, well, there's, you know, there's some po positive associations from the old logo of the Washington football team. You know, this is her uh, point. She says, you know, there's these emotional connection, the sense of nostalgia, um, you know, so, so, you know, she might associate it with aspects of her childhood, et cetera. And so I'm curious how you sort of roll over the sort of positive associations, you know, childhood, the champions, lo loyalty, nostalgia, awareness, all these things. How do you roll, how do you take those aspects, roll them into the new brand, but get rid of these negative associations? Um, Interestingly, I think the Washington team did it with, uh, with the way they branded the Washington football team. Okay. They showed the longevity of it. They showed old style mm. type. They showed just the plain name. And it was reminiscent of a field of dreams. Yeah. It was reminiscent of, you know, yes, people will come. They're, they're going to be so nostalgic <laughs> for a time that where people didn't even wear helmets, let alone have good ones that kept them from getting concussions that are awfully bad. Yeah. It, it, yes. So it, what they've done is, is, and I wish they would just stay with it, but I think they're going to try to ease back into the native business, which would be unfortunate. Oh, okay. uh, it, it, and we'll see, we'll see how that goes. Uh, they have an opportunity to do so much more. They can break new ground. They can name it yeah. all sorts of exciting new things. They um, they can have a contest. They've invited uh, people to submit names and submit designs. Uh, so they're, they're getting people ready for a possible change. But I really do think that they took it right back to maybe not jo George Preston Marshall's dream of the team, but maybe what people thought they were getting out of it. Okay. I can't begin to counsel anyone on how you deal with people who are attached to inanimate objects such as a logo mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to such an extent that they cry. And they they uh, throw a tantrum and they 
say, how can I ever live without this? Uh, that is, um, a lot of times we would be asked, no matter where we were trying to make change, people would say, well, don't you have anything better to think about than this? Well, yeah, we're the people who do those big <laughs> things and we're the people who do all that stuff. And they would say, don't you have, um, don't you have a way to, to, um, I mean, why are you always just fixated on this, trying to uh, keep these these names? Uh, and say, well, why are you so attached to these names? Why, mm -hmm. What is what is the psychosis? What yeah. is the attraction of this uh, feathered headdress or this rubber Tommy Hawk, as they call them, or this? Um, uh, big drum or pe just people doing the tomahawk chop what right. is the is the mindless attachment of that um i don't even think i want to know the answer to that although i'm sure someone is doing a study about it but but things <laughs> change i mean people aren't yeah. attached to that really they're attached to the team of course of course, I, I completely agree with you. And I, you know, it's, it's funny because people think they may be attached to one thing and it, you know, it turns out, but I love, I love what you're saying though, is that, you know, you can do it. You can sort of call, call back some of the traditions in history without, without necessarily calling the racist associations. I mean, that's, that's, that's the sort of ideal situation, I guess, if you can manage well, it. When, when Clyde Warrior, a famous Ponca fancy dancer in uh, the early 60s and the founder of Oklahoma Indian Youth Council and one of the founders of the National Indian Youth Council um, and a very great orator. When he recruited me as one of many people in my high school mm -hmm. in uh, 1962, I was a senior in, in Oklahoma City School, Harding, and he recruited uh, us, anyone who was interested, to join him in this effort that he was engaged in across several campuses and with other people who were starting the National Indian Youth Council to, um, of course, emphasize student rights and voting rights. But his, his burning passion was to get rid of these stereotypes. Yeah. any kind of stereotype and his target was little red at the university of oklahoma mm. now it used to be that all these schools there were no mascots in the old days there were just colors so oklahoma was big red still is uh mm -hmm. Dartmouth, big green yep stanford cardinal right color <laughs> not the bird <laughs> right right Syracuse, right. use orange not the fruit and uh so they started out as colors so you had big red and then they went to a diminutive dancing mascot called little red which was always some white guy in school one of the students at ou who um the native students would call the dancing idiot and he would go out there and dance uh, look like a fool and be dressed in some outlandish kind of outfit that wasn't quite native and wasn't quite any particular native mm -hmm. nation or tribe and he um so clyde warrior took aim at that that's and he always yeah. said, and it and it struck me that that the worst one is under the Capitol, right inside the Capitol, in Washington D.C., and that's the R word. That's the worst one. And he mm. articulated that and why, but the close up, the close at hand one, was just down the street in Norman, Oklahoma, and that was Little Red. So that was '62. And yeah. he passed in, in uh, the late 60s, and he didn't get to see the end of it, but he got to build the great coalitions uh, 
across the campus of OU and other campuses and across the committees of students of color. And um, so you had the Chicano committee, you had the mm -hmm. black committee, uh, the women's committee, lots of committees. And uh, he built those coalitions and his wife did, Della Warrior, who's still living and a museum director and, uh, and an educator. They and many, many other people built that kind of coalition where they would help the native people, all the other students would help the native people with Little Red. Mm -hmm. And everyone had a priority. And right there, the priorities were the, the black students wanted to get rid of Sambo's restaurants. They couldn't stand the name Sambo. They wanted to get rid of that. Chicano students wanted to get rid of Frito Bandito. Hmm. And so that happened. All of it happened. And um, the women uh, students wanted to get rid of sexism in advertising, mm -hmm. wherever mm -hmm. you find it, wherever you see it, and to notice that it exists. So these are broad coalitions, very much like what's happening today. Yeah. Coalescing around Black Lives Matter which mm -hmm. is, I, I think, a very positive sign and, and uh, it, it, where people are, are once again saying, what are your priorities? What is it you yeah. want? We're saying land back. Right. We're saying land back, which means everything. It means names back. It means water back. It means people back. It means anything that you want it to mean, but it means land back too mm -hmm. and maybe first. And so right after a land acknowledgement, um, there are Tongva people and they want their land back. Right. So someone should have the land acknowledgement and then have a meeting about the land going back. Mm -hmm. And would it be all of it? Would it be some of it? Would it be some joint share, joint manage, joint steward? What, what is, how do you do that? Yeah, that's the conversation, isn't it? And that's what we're talking about in every aspect of of this time of social and racial reckoning. That's what it starts with is talk and yeah. identification of, of what your priorities are, what that means, how you how you um, and, and it doesn't need a dissertation. We didn't need to, to someone yeah. to write out a whole treatise on why Sambo is in Right. Right. We got it. Right. Yep. Suzanne, this is this is fascinating. And I think this is actually a really good segue. You know, I think we only have about 10 minutes left, and there's some really great questions from the student students. If you don't mind, I'm gonna ask you some of oh. them. Um and I, I think some of them are my my former students, uh, and so I'm I'm excited to see you know these these great questions here. So, yeah. So actually, so Daniel uh, Melling asks, um, you know, the campaign against Native American mascots has been going on for sixty plus years, but seen many rapid wins in the last uh, twelve months. Um, uh, so as an activist, he asks, how do you maintain um, uh, patience? Uh, uh, over the years and speed to move quickly when openings arise. I think that's a, a nice sort of, you know, how do you mean balance that? Well, it, sometimes opportunities just present themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, as soon as we, we filed our lawsuit in 92 against the Washington football team, it made a huge splash. Everyone knew about it. And uh, some people called me and in California, a, uh, young people who were students at a high school said they were now talking with the school about changing the name of it, which they did. And they were the third generation to do that. Oh, interesting. Okay. And it just happened that the right principal and the right mm -hmm. faculty, uh, counselor and the right teacher and the right students said, it, it at the right moment when there was a jarring thing like a big lawsuit against a pro football team um that that shook people in some way that um 
made that happen. So that gives you a lot of heart. Yeah. You don't have to be patient. And it wasn't that three generations of people were, were patient. It was that they tried their best and they couldn't do it and they couldn't do it and they couldn't do it. And then finally, here's this third generation and they got it done. Mm -hmm. uh, Amber Mackamer and, and one Chumash parent and one non-Chumash yep. parent uh, got it led the charge to get all the schools in the LA Unified School District changed. And they did it all, one clean sweep. And it just happened that it was at the right time. That, it, so you have to have, to have things ready. Um, also, you have to know when you've won. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um... That's a good point to so sort of keep that perspective there. Um, so um, Gila uh, asks, um, what are your thoughts on teams such as the University of Utah Athletics paying tribes for use of their names? <laughs> <laughs> well, shortly after um, Little Red became the first in American sports to uh, the first dead mascot in American sports. Mm -hmm. um, the Utes followed. Um, and, and they had some pretty disgusting images and they got rid of them. And that was good. But they didn't do everything. Mm -hmm. um, Marquette uh, would take almost 40 years to finally get rid of the warrior. But in the meantime, and right after OU dropped Little Red, they got rid of Willy Wampum. A, a school in the South got rid of Chief Nakahoma. Or, uh, mm -hmm. uh, please. And, and that continued into the Braves. Um, so it, it, it was... Um, well, and at Dartmouth, well, Dartmouth and Stanford, you know, they changed two and four years after OU did. OU mm -hmm. had the first in 1970, and then Stanford and, and Dartmouth in 72 and 74, and then Syracuse in 78, 79. Uh, at Dartmouth, there is uh, almost every two years an effort to bring back the Indians. Wow. And, that, and that's been gone since the early 70s. Uh, but you have uh, a, a bunch of people who, who um, wh whenever they take over the, whenever the Dartmouth Review has a new editor, the Dartmouth Review is a conservative rag that has nothing to do with the school, uh, but it sounds like it does. Whenever they take over that, they want to revive the Indians, so they picked the fight with the NADs, the Native Americans at Dartmouth. And it, so it's a huge brouhaha. And, it, and every other class of, uh, of NADs has to fight that fight all over again. Yeah. And it's really a tiresome thing for them. Uh, but I'll tell you what they're doing by, by trying to revive uh, the Indians at Dartmouth is they're making a huge new generation of well-educated, well-trained activists uh, with fresh arguments. <laughs> yeah, that's that's fair. Um, <laughs> Um, okay, so I think I think this is we have time for one last question. This is from a prospective MBA. Um, how do we understand the nuance of branding? They ask. For example, the indigenous branding on Land O'Lakes Butter was designed. Uh, by native peoples, did the pendulum swing too far? That that the 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 new branding was done by what? I'm sorry. Uh, they wrote the new branding was designed, or I guess received input by native peoples. Oh, yes, and then they asked, it was yeah. actually done by by a very fine artist who is a, uh, was a an Ojibwe artist, uh, an otherwise very fine artist. It's not his best work, obviously. <laughs> and it was certainly a cartoon, and it was not um, anything that was flattering to Native women or any woman. So um, 
you know, it's fair game to criticize what you see before you and and not say, well, it depends on who made it. Right, now, right. One, one subject I didn't mean to duck is, is it, I just lost it in whatever I was saying. <laughs> it's, um, about what do I think about a, a tribe selling its mm -hmm. uh, the right to use its name? Well, it, that's that sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Two, okay. sovereignty isn't always the thing that anyone else outside that entity thinks is the best thing to do. Right. Uh, it, you know, the tourist trap in, in Mexico, the, the uh, uh, poison carts in, in Vietnam, or, uh, there, there are things that um, people have a right to do. Mm -hmm. Countries have a right to do. So right. it, you would hope that people, that most native people would understand the difference between being asked if they could have, if someone could, if someone came to you and said, we, we have a children's hospital and we'd like to call it the, the Cheyenne Children's Hospital. Wow. Now that's worth thinking about. Mm -hmm. If someone said, we're putting up, or hey, did you hear someone's putting up a Cheyenne bar and grill? No. You'd, you'd want to protest that or say, you know, affirm no, or uh, we don't like it and that's cultural appropriation and so forth. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you do have, you have marketing rights for your mm -hmm. name and your image and your um, right. whatever is your cultural right. Mm -hmm. So it's... Um, I'm, I think it is a huge mistake for anyone to lease or rent or sell their name to something as undignified as a team name with absolutely no possibility of, of being a dignified thing. Mm. If it were for a school, I mean, here... If you had a school called the Martin Luther King Jr. High School, that's an honor. That is a dignified honor, honoring thing. And the family might say, absolutely, how wonderful. But if you said, let's call it the MLK kickers as a team, I don't, not so much. Mm -hmm. And certainly not the N word. Or anything else that is slang or uh, something about the the people as a whole. So, I think just a basic watchword that if if it's something that involves dancing for the white man, um, if it's something that involves that someone else's entertainment at your expense, recreation at your expense it's never going to get more dignified than that and just don't do it. But if it's something that involves true honor, uh, think about it. If it's a park, think about it. Um, not if it's a bad word, but think about <laughs> yeah. if it's your word, if it's your name, that's a possibility. Or maybe you can come up with a better name in your language. And then mm -hmm. everyone knows one word of your language. There, there are all sorts yeah. of ways to do it, but that it begins by talking. It begins with the dialogue. And if you don't respect the other person enough to have the dialogue, then you shouldn't be able to have any of the goodies that go along right. with it or that right. you want. <laughs> That's a great, it's a very good heuristic, um, a good rule of thumb. Well, I know that we're out of time, sadly, but I, I wanted to thank you uh, on behalf of, of, of Anderson and uh, Impact Week. Um, we are so appreciative for the work that you've done and for spending your time with us. Uh, and I, I've learned a lot and I'm, I'm hopeful that we can cross paths in the, in the future as well. And thank you again for spending the time with us.
Well, thank you for your good questions and nice conversation. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank <laughs> you.